Okay. I think we waited long enough. So as a little bit of an introduction, um, Ellen Lupton is a writer, curator, educator, and designer. Uh, she hails from Philadelphia, PA. Uh, she is currently uh, the Betty Cook and William Steinmetz Design Chair at MICA in Baltimore, Maryland. And she is also the Senior Curator at Cooper Hewitt, the Smithsonian Design Museum in NYC. Uh, Ellen makes design smarter <laughs> if <laughs> design has a sense of its own history and understanding of the theory that drives it and a voice for its continuing discourse it's largely because ellen wrote it thought it or spoke it um, ellen's career and accompanying list of accomplishments would take so long for me to list that you would get sick of me gabbing uh, but to name a few she's authored numerous books on design processes including thinking with type graphic design thinking, graphic design, the new basics, and type on screen. Several of her books grace my library shelves. I know they grace yours too. Um, she has consistently exhibited works and published essays throughout her career. She received the AIGA Gold Medal for Lifetime Achievement in 2007, and she recently was named a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And tonight, Ellen will talk to us about how uh, to use storytelling to touch people's minds and emotions. So answering questions like how do we move, act, and respond when we look at a poster, website, or retail environment? How are designers uh, building those narratives in response to the urgent crises of today? Because there are plenty of crises today. <laughs> um, I'm incredibly humbled and excited that AIGA Toledo is lucky enough to host a talent as prolific and accoladed as Ellen. So I'm going to stop talking. And without further ado, I'm going to let Ellen take over. Thank you, Allie. Thank you, AIGA Toledo. I'm so happy to be here. I'm sitting here in my house in Baltimore, Maryland, which is very quiet right now. At some point, my two little dogs are going to explode with joy. So wait for that. We'll use it as a um, kind of pause moment <laughs> at some point. <laughs> so I'm gonna grab the screen and talk to you about storytelling. Um, I am a curator at, at Cooper Hewitt Museum in New York City. We are closed, which is so sad, but that doesn't mean we're not doing tons of stuff. So I'm doing talks all around the country, visiting classrooms, doing AIGA stuff. My colleagues are creating amazing uh, seminars and educational programs. So come visit us online. We are here and we are here for you. And tonight I'm gonna talk about storytelling, which is, um, the title of a book published by Cooper Hewitt in 2017. Um, and in this book, we explore how storytelling is a tool for designers. Um, and I wanna take you through some of those tools, some of those ideas, some of the principles of storytelling so that you can use them in your work. And I think that today, storytelling is more important than ever as designers are out there educating and inspiring their communities and helping us all build a future. Um, storytelling is about action <laughs> and often designers are giving us, the users, a tool for action. So vote by mail, in person, however you need to do it. Uh, that's a story that you can be a hero of. Designers are creating tools to help people engage in their community and do it safely. Um, one of the principles of, of stories that I discovered when I started researching this topic is that every story has a path. So every story takes place in time and every story takes place in space and stories they, um, they unfold, right? They're an experience that begins and has duration and comes to some kind of uh, conclusion. In some stories, the path is so important, it's almost a character, right? So in the famous fairy tale Hansel and Gretel, the kids make a path in the woods, but the path is made of, of cookie crumbs and bird seeds, and so they get terribly lost. 
the yellow brick road is the most important thing in the Wizard of Oz. And it takes Dorothy and her friends to a special place, to a new world. Uh, and often we as designers are inviting users and the public to enter a world, right? To open a book, uh, to download an app, uh, to read the text in an exhibition. We are creating a kind of circumstance for people to enter, uh, to enter an experience that is different from where they are now, right? <clears throat> we create a special place. One of my favorite movies is Mad Max Fury Road, and the road is one of the heroes of the story, right? The road is what is taking uh, the heroes and their friends um, on this adventure uh, to what they hope will be a better place. Um, here's a very ordinary road and a very ordinary picture, and nothing's really happening in this picture, but because there's a path, through the woods, I feel invited to enter. I feel like I'm going to go someplace. And so something for you to think about in your work is are you creating that point of entry for a user, for a reader, for a viewer, right? We want to invite people to enter a scene and do something to engage in some kind of action. These are all pictures of big forests. And if you Google big forest, you will get pictures like these um, because these are the kinds of pictures that people like. <laughs> and even though nothing is happening in any of these pictures, there's no wolf, there's no little kids getting lost, there's no wicked witch. There's some kind of intimation of narrative, a really big tree, two trees having a conversation a waterfall, a path, a brook, light filtering uh, through the leaves. So all of those things invite, um, invite a user to begin an action, to go someplace. This is a poster from the collection of Cooper Hewitt Museum and it's by E. McKnight Coffer from the early 20th century. Artists have always known to make that path. Um, and if we follow the path into this beautiful parkland, we are rewarded with sunlight and shadows and baby mushrooms. This is another poster by E. McKnight Coffer and it's from 20 years later. And now he's a modernist. Now he's a futurist. But in a way, the concept of the poster is the same. There's a path and the path is leading us to the future. The future is a motorcycle. So thinking about these paths and thinking about how we as designers invite people into an adventure, I think is really key to thinking about graphic design and even something two dimensional like a book cover takes place over time. It has a narrative to it that we uncover in the act of reading and understanding what the image is all about. Sometimes in a time of crisis, like we're in now, we can discover new pathways. This is a beautiful graphic by Georgia Lupi. And she's talking about how cities all around the world have closed themselves down to traffic and created new ways for pedestrians and cyclists to make use of the city, to create new paths through the city. This is another graphic by Georgia showing the incredible heroic migration of healthcare workers to New York City during April. And people wanted to be there. They wanted to go there uh, and help confront this terrible danger facing humanity. Um, this is a, a poster in London by Yinka Elori. And to experience this mural, you walk past it. You have to experience it over time. And in so doing, you discover this optimistic uh, message. Lots of designers are making proposals for new pathways in public space to help people be outside 
and be together, but keep their distance. And a lot of these are just um, renderings, they're just concepts, but some of them have actually been produced. This is a beautiful design in a piazza in Northern Italy. Uh, and the designers created this grid of squares that are painted with temporary paint uh, in the town square to allow people uh, to, to use the public space uh, and use it safely. And it essentially it's graphic design applied in an architectural way to the city. Um, and in order to explain it to people, they posted around town these wonderful, just wheat pasted, uh, simple posters that explain the geometry and the concept of the piece. And what I love about it is that the squares are in a gradient. They're not all the same. And they really relate to the history of, of Renaissance painting, um, the history of uh, linear perspective that was born in this part of the world. In New York City, Paula Scher created these graphics in the beautiful Highline Elevated Park, a wonderful public place that now you need a ticket to go there. They have to uh, sort of hold back the number of people using the space. And her beautiful pattern of dots helps people to keep their distance. Um, so I'm inspired by what graphic designers are doing in response to what's happening in their world and creating new paths, new breadcrumbs, uh, new lines, new, new ways of navigating a world that has quite suddenly changed. The arc, the designers, um, well, actually, <laughs> novelists and, and playwrights and screenwriters talk about stories as having an arc. So a story begins quietly. The hero gets a challenge. The hero tries to solve that challenge. And as they rise in action, they reach the top of the arc. There's more and more energy stored up. And we have the climax. And then whoosh, they come down the other side and the action is complete. Um, and that kind of arc exists all through life, all through nature. Uh, when you're hungry, you start feeling uh, some desire, some interest, perhaps you smell the falafel cooking, then you finally get to eat it and you're in the moment and it's happening, the story is there. And then whoosh, suddenly you're done, you just, feel awful, you're complete. And so that sense of an arc that begins and rises and completes is really essential to storytelling. It's something we find in sexual activity. Sometime I wanna call up this scientist and say, what is it with those two mountaintops? What do you know that, I don't know. <laughs> um, but this sense of, of energy and completion is something that human beings really love. Um, in design, we often translate that into three steps, um, sometimes four steps. So that rhythm of beginning, middle, end is something that uh, people are very comfortable with. It's a way that they can make sense of a complex um, process. It's a way to invite people uh, into a process that they might not understand yet. So we see that pattern of three in a lot of websites and apps. We see it in fairy tales, three steps, three wishes, three choices, three princesses. Um, you can download templates that help you turn whatever process it is that you have into three easy steps. And of course that requires editing. It requires eliminating what isn't important. It requires simplifying, it requires finding the beats, finding the three high points that make people feel like they have that sense of completion, beginning, middle, end, one, two, three. This is from the Blue Apron website. They've been doing very well as people hole up in their houses and teach themselves how to cook. And Blue Apron will send you a box of groceries, um, a true miracle. Um, and on their website, they use these beautiful whimsical illustrations. 
and this very simple narrative text to take people through this process and reassure them that this is a story that anybody can master. So one, choose your meals. Two, unpack your box. Three, create magic. Um, that's the whole part where you actually have to cut the food and cook it and eat it and do the dishes. <laughs> and they simplify that into this one step. Um, I accept it. It's a fiction. It's a story. And it's a story that entices us to enter this world and try it out. Um, this is a beautiful graphic for social distancing. And the designer has chosen three characters. Um, that number three makes the story accessible. It makes it understandable. It gives it a sense of wholeness and completeness. So looking at that number three can be really helpful in your work, especially when you're trying to explain something complex and something that takes place over time. I also wanna talk about emotions because stories engage us emotionally. They take us somewhere emotionally. The great postmodern novelist, Kurt Vonnegut, had a theory when he was in graduate school that every story could be graphed as an arc between ecstasy and misery. There's another kind of narrative arc, but it's one based on the degree of pain experienced uh, by the principal character. And these are some of his, his diagrams. Um, so a man in the hole, it starts out okay, the man finds in a hole, terrible, and then he gets saved and everybody's happy. Um, and he applied this arc of, of misery and good fortune to every story that people could write. Um, this one is Franz Kafka's book, Metamorphosis, which starts out terrible and gets even worse. Uh, the main character wakes up one day and discovers he's a cockroach. And at the end of the book, spoiler alert, he's dead. Um, so some stories just go from bad to worse. Um, in design, we try not to go from bad to worse. We try to keep people relatively happy, but we know they encounter friction and difficult parts along the way. And so user experience designers have actually adopted Kurt Vonnegut's theory of the emotional roller coaster of storytelling to analyze the user journey. Um, where do users in, encounter friction? Where are they satisfied? Where can we give them rewards? This is a beautiful illustration by Carles Garcia O'Dowd describing the kind of user journey of being trapped in your apartment during quarantine. <laughs> and so I love the um, sort of dark humor of his user experience journey traveling through space um, as he sits there at his desk with his, his teacup um, and his computer screen keeping him company. So let's try to apply the idea of the uh, emotional journey to Cinderella. And let's imagine that Cinderella is a customer experience, okay? So at the beginning of the story, Cinderella is miserable. She has nothing to wear. She can't go to the ball. So what does she do? She downloads the Fairy Godmother app. Wouldn't you? And this is fantastic. It is a great product and she is a happy customer. She loves the crown, she loves the dress, she loves the carriage. There's just one problem, curfew. She's gotta leave the party by midnight or else. So Cinderella's at the party. She's having a wonderful time and is getting to be close to midnight. And she runs down the steps to the parking lot. One of the stupid glass slippers falls off. And right then at 11.59, what happens to Cinderella? Surge pricing. Nobody likes that. Buzzkill, bad news. She's not happy anymore. 
So the designers back at fairygodmother.com say, what are we going to do to get our customer service ratings back up? So they create a new feature called Lost and Found. They violate Cinderella's privacy. They go to her house with that lost glass slipper. Best thing is they make the driver pay for it. And we all know what happens when Cinderella gets her shoe back. Yes, that's how the story ends, happily ever after. So as designers, we can think about making an emotional connection with our users. We have to understand that sometimes the emotions are powerful and positive and fun. Sometimes people have to wait. Sometimes we have to warn them. Uh, sometimes the emotions that we're dealing with are mixed and complex. So how do we make emotional connections with people? Um, you see here on the screen a poster for recognizing the symptoms of COVID-19 published by the Centers for Disease Control. And I would say that this poster is trying to eliminate as much emotion as possible from this topic, right? The people have no facial expressions. They are completely blank. They are not worried or concerned um, and neither should we be, right? And, and perhaps that's appropriate, right? The CDC should be keeping people calm and sharing rational information. Um, I wanna show you though, a completely different approach to the same problem. This is by the great information designer, Mona Chalabi. Um, and she decided to represent these symptoms in a way that is emotionally rich, um, that is uh, funny and a little bit scary um, and touches people where they live, right? Uh, she's attempted to uh, make this subject uh, realistic, raw, human, but also approachable. Now, would a government publish that? Probably not, <laughs> but it's a really beautiful piece of emotionally connected public information, right? Public communication. This is by the Spanish furniture designer, Jamie Hayon, uh, and it is my favorite social distance graphic. Uh, it takes a subject that we, um, associate with negativity, with separation, and makes it social. These two birds are there to be together. They just have to keep their distance. So there's something happy and warm and humorous in the way the subject is approached. Or these wonderful posters from the Taiwan National Palace Museum using pieces from their museum collection to help people understand social distance, to understand the, uh, the dimensions being discussed, right? The human dimension being discussed. Um, and I think these are uh, playful and warm and fun and connecting. Um, that. Uh, this is designed here in Baltimore where I live at the Johns Hopkins University. Uh, where the wonderful uh, civil engineer, Lauren Gardner, started the program at Hopkins to track COVID-19 infections around the world. Uh, and this has become um, perhaps the most important piece of graphic design being created today. Uh, and she uses the color, she and her now a big team, use the color red uh, to, to show the spread of the disease. And that gives the graphics an emotional intensity. And in fact, she's come under fire from some people on the right for saying that it makes the graphic too alarming. Um, I would say that she uses color quite intentionally here to convey the seriousness of the content. The hero's journey. So we've looked at arcs, we looked at waves, we've looked at curves, now let's look at a circle. So the hero's journey is a classic structure in literature and fairy, -tailing, fairy tales and epic poetry in which a hero begins in an ordinary world 
and they are invited to leave on an adventure. And that adventure takes them to a new world. It's often called the green world. It's a magical place, a dangerous place, a place very different from where they came from. And then they leave, they return home. They go back to the beginning, they cycle back to the beginning, but now they're changed, they're transformed. And so many stories take this pattern, uh, the story of Ulysses, the story of Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz, right? She literally goes to a green world and then ends up back in Kansas. I never quite understood that part. Why does she go back? I would have stayed in Oz, but she goes back. There's Mad Max Fury Road where the hero leaves the, the devastated city, this autocratic city where she lives. And she, she goes in search of a green place where there, um, things are growing, where it's verdant, where there's agriculture. And she gets there and that place is already dead. But the women there give her seeds. And so she returns to that old city, the original city with the tools for making that place green. So it's a classic hero's journey. And as designers, we can use this pattern a lot in our work. Uh, the time in a story is not always linear. It doesn't always go in one direction. We often create things that are a circle, a cycle, a loop. This is a beautiful emotional impact diagram uh, by Solid Light, which is an exhibition design company. And so if you think about exhibitions, they're a circle. People enter and then they exit, usually through the same door, but they've experienced a journey with different levels of emotional intensity. Or now the theory of circular design, the notion that everything we make should be able to be remade into new products. We need to view waste as raw material. We need to be designing the circle of the products that we create. We need to account for the full life cycle that they exist in. Beautiful piece published this morning by Aggie Toppins on AIGA Ion Design about how design history classes all around the world are abandoning the idea of linear history in favor of, uh, of circles and cycles and looking for themes and topics that reverberate across culture instead of being associated with just one kind of storyline, right? One dominant Western storyline. So the idea of the circle, um, of course, GIFs and loops are my favorite kind of circle. And I was actually staring at this during a meeting today on Zoom, <laughs> mesmerized and trying to figure out, is it one pig or two? I think it's just one pig. <laughs> I love that little pig. Um, so let's take a, a hero's journey to Ikea. Okay, uh, some of you may have uh, been in an Ikea store before. I hope you survived. Uh, and you may have thought, well, an Ikea store is a maze. I thought so too. And then I did some research on Ikea and it turns out there's a whole academic literature about how people behave in Ikea stores. And I learned that an Ikea store is not a maze, it is a labyrinth. Okay, and these are two different paths, two different narrative structures. A maze is designed for you to get lost in. You have to make constant decisions. Do I go left? Do I go right? But a labyrinth is actually a single path. There are no choices. You are sent on a journey that's very directed. And actually that's what going to Ikea is like. So you're the hero, you get out of your car, you enter this new place, right? You cross the threshold into a new place where everything is blue and yellow. Um, and you enter on a path, a kind of yellow brick road uh, that takes you through the different stations of Ikea existence. 
Um, and it's, that path is paved. It's a different material. It has a little border around it to discourage you from exiting the path. It has arrows, it has signs. You don't get lost at Ikea because you're stuck on this route that takes you past all of these events to see, right? These scenarios, these staged uh, presentations of products. And then at the end, when you finally make it through the warehouse and the checkout and the as is department, there is the final hot dog. And this hot dog is so cheap, they're paying you to eat it. Because the folks at Ikea know that if you don't eat that hot dog, you are going to die like Jack Nicholson at the end of The Shining in the maze where he freezes to death. This hot dog is crucial to the story. Okay, so I'm gonna end by talking about a case study, a beautiful design branding and information design case study. And I want to talk us through the different ways that storytelling is used in this project. So I want you to be on the lookout for the path and for emotions. Um, okay, and here's a designer. Her name is Eden Liu, and she's a fantastic graphic designer and user experience designer and a great person. Uh, and she was invited to create a logo for an organization called The Last Mile. And what The Last Mile does is it gets together volunteers in cities all around the US to deliver PPE, like masks and uh, sanitary equipment to healthcare workers in different kinds of facilities, hospitals and uh, care homes and so forth. And so that's called The Last Mile. Right, and it turns out there's a big problem in getting this equipment, once it's donated and collected from different sources, actually getting it into the hands of the people that need it, and that's the last mile. So her logo shows a path, it shows a road, right? Because that's what this company is about, getting things out on the road. But the road has an intersection and that intersection becomes a cross, like the Red Cross of healthcare. So it's a really great logo and the organization loved it. And Eden Liu was really happy to create it. Um, and then she started to think, is there more I can do? Like this project starts with a logo, but there must be more. Um, and so she got involved with the organization and she saw that they had these diagrams explaining what they were doing, how they get from warehouse to person to the front door to delivery services and so on. And these are these really complicated diagrams. And she thought, hmm, I think we could make that simpler. I think we could clean that up. Um, I think we could turn it into a story that people can really understand. So if you're gonna be a volunteer for this organization, you might find it a lot more appealing and a lot less intimidating if the process is something that's told in a clear way. So I love seeing how Eden took her skill as a graphic designer and started with a logo and ended up really getting into the heart of what this organization does. In order to do that, she had to create icons and she collaborated with other designers and illustrators to create these icons. And the icons show people doing things, right? Delivering PPE, um, people who are characters. Um, it shows a road, it shows a path. And so these icons help to bring to life the story of the organization. Um, she also commissioned these incredible illustrations, which bring us in, into the scene of the action, right? Into the emotion. So icons are kind of cold, right? They're alphabetic, they're very clean and simple, but these illustrations have movement and shadow and real people doing stuff. And so they really help to enrich and complete that sense of storytelling around this organization. 
Um, Eden, in a beautiful presentation I saw her give, she said, sometimes graphic design is like being a design janitor. Um, and in saying that, she really elevated what designers do. I think sometimes we feel like we're not saving lives, we're not, um, we're not in the thick of things, we're just making stuff look better. But she proved the designer is actually an essential worker, like a janitor, a person who's keeping things clean, keeping people safe, keeping buildings functioning. Um, and I really love that definition of design. And I think her example in her work is a really beautiful testament to what designers can be doing to make a better world and to support others. Um, finally, your process is a path, right? Designers are on a journey to create stuff. Um, and many of us um, try to follow uh, principles and techniques that organize our process. I found these just by Googling, you know, design process diagrams. I've drawn plenty of my own as well. Um, and they attempt to show us design itself as a kind of story. But I'm gonna end with one that a, a student at MICA did, uh, kind of a piece of graffiti that they left in a, in a group project. And in a way, um, I think this <laughs> puts together the way many of us in practice do our process. And this is some pretty great storytelling um, full of uh, suspense um, and uh, narrative conflict and ultimate uh, resolution. Um, and I'm gonna leave it at that as a kind of image of good enough process and what we're all trying to do in, in muddling through the rest of 2020. So um, thank you for coming and I'd love to have a chat with people that maybe have some questions. Well, awesome. Thank you so much, Ellen, for such You're a welcome. phenomenal presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, to keep things moving along, uh, I'm going to kick off the Q&A portion of tonight's presentation. Um, so on screen, there's actually a Q&A button that allows you to submit questions. Um, you can submit these questions either signed or anonymously, um, and we will try to work our way through every single one of them. Um, that being said, I'm actually going to hand this over to Allie uh, to get a question of our own answered. I have so many questions, but I won't take up all the time. Uh, <laughs> so one question I did have, Ellen, and maybe this gets a little too deep too fast. Um, but... Go deep, Allie. <laughs> it's Ohio. We're counting on you. <laughs> true. God, so true. Um, I just kind of want to pick your brain a little bit on avoiding bias when like applying the principle of, of story principles of storytelling in, mm -hmm. in you know UX design or things like environmental design um, I mean is that something that you just kind of have to remind yourself of is it something that's already built into kind of these pre-existing you know tropes that you know you kind of touched on yeah I mean that's very interesting you could say that all of these uh, all the patterns right UX is full of patterns and you could say that all of those patterns, because they pre-exist, um, have the potential to have bias in them. And so I guess you could say any question should be, any pattern should be uh, questioned. Um, okay. You know, stories uh, often use types, right? They assume that the hero, the hero is a man and the, you know, person being rescued is a woman and that everybody's white. <laughs> so like questioning those assumptions about who the characters are and inverting roles. You know, there's a lot about, um, there's some really cool like illustration kits for uh, making sure that like your icon systems have all different kinds of people in them. I really appreciate those kind of tools for designers that help us to question those biases. So that, that's a really interesting area. Yeah, I think it's it's interesting also um, kind of thinking about that in relationship to, I'm assuming maybe unfairly so, in your design career, 
there's been at least evolutions or shifts in how people think about just the concept of design. I mean, it's gone through several, you know, evolutions and, and there have been many people who have touched it and shaped it in some way. And I guess like, do you, have you seen like this concept of design storytelling as something that evolved out of, you know, other research? Is it something that's just kind of always existed in maybe like a different namesake for you? Is it something that I think it's really become um, super important because of design being so much more digital. And that I think, you know, when I was growing up as a designer, our work was 2D. And so there is this emphasis on like um, composition, you know, symmetry and asymmetry and balance and, and figure around which are actually all temporal ideas. So like mm -hmm. even looking at a two dimensional design is a temporal experience. You know, your eye is moving around and making judgments and discovering things, right? Reading is temporal. But I think because today so much of what we do is creating uh, tools and experiences that people must um, uh, unpack over time, storytelling has become uh, more visible. Right and and more um, more I think it's always been there, but it's become more essential. Yeah. You know, every time you pitch your work, you're telling a story. You're like sequencing a deck, and the deck has to have an arc, and the deck has to have high points and low points. It has to have beats, right? So f filmmakers talk about beats as like the intense parts that people will remember. And that's what we do as designers when we're uh, explaining work to a client, pitching work to a client. Yeah. And I think those skills have become foregrounded in a way that when I was in school, nobody talked about pitching work. Right. It was right. all just about the, the object that you were making and not the experience around it. Yeah. So it was really about experience design being everywhere, you know. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm going to kick us off with our, uh, our first attendee question. Um, first and foremost, apologies if I mispronounce any names. Um, I'm doing my best. Um, so first off, uh, Andrea says, hey there, I'm a new professor at BGSU. And in our time-based media class, we are developing interactive storytelling websites addressing racism in Northwest Ohio. Are there recommended arcs when addressing racism? Or do you have any advice when uh, telling this type of story or advocating for active anti-racism in general? Um, well, I, I think like many people, I've been reading a lot about this and trying to educate myself and you know, reading a lot of um, black educators about anti-racism and literature and poetry by black writers to really get inside that kind of question and, and you know, learn, right? Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I've heard is to be very conscious of trauma and not re-traumatizing people. Yeah. Um, so there can be like, uh, there can be too much emphasis on like enlightening white people. Mm -hmm at the expense of, of causing more harm to those who are victims of racism. So um, that's something I would just be conscious of um, to the questioner about, you know, t telling stories that don't always cast uh, black people or indigenous people or people of color as victims, you know, and not, not always, you know, I think that's really important to address uh, trauma. Absolutely. All right, well, oh, so many questions coming in. All right, let's see. Um, so we have another question, um, Anonymous. Uh, they start off with, thank you, what a wonderful presentation. Um, can you talk about how you get permission or not, um, fair use, to show all these fantastic examples uh, to tell this <laughs> story so visually? I love your book and love this presentation. Well, a lot of the examples in my presentation are from my book, and all of those I get permission, you know, to use. Uh, some of the examples, you know, I've redrawn and recreated, like uh, Kurt Vonnegut's um, charts. Mm -hmm. um, when I'm giving a presentation, 
I confess I don't get permission for every single image. I just try to give credit um, yeah. that these are things that are out in the culture and I'm not claiming that I created them. I'm a commentator mm -hmm. uh, sharing them and making a new narrative or new argument with them. Um, I just do my best to, uh, <laughs> to credit all the creators. <laughs> I well, think Ronnie well, would be okay with it. If I, I, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I show a video of him talking, which is really fun too. Awesome. So another um, anonymous question uh, starts with, thanks, Ellen. Which one is by now the most effective storytelling design you think you've done? That I've done? Oh my goodness. <laughs> um, well, I'm a writer. Uh, so I create books about design and I think one of the things that distinguishes my books is that I really want them to be tools for my readers. They're not about, um, in, you know, uh, improving people's knowledge. It's like, I really want my books to be useful. And that really gets at the core of, of storytelling to me because stories are action. And often a story is uh, describing an action, right? The story of the Wizard of Oz or Hansel and Gretel. But in design, we're often delivering to users a tool for their action, right? For them to um, learn something, do something, put on a mask, uh, buy something, <laughs> yeah. right? Teach their children something, uh, be enlightened about uh, racial injustice. Um, those are actions for the user. So I, I'm happiest in, in my books when people are using them to make their own design, you know, that they are themselves tools for action, for doing manuals, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, well, I'm going to skip down a little bit here for the questions, um, mainly because of the last line, which I'll read in order. Um, so Shiva says, hello, Ellen, thank you for your talk. I am from India and we love a good narrative. Can you talk about cultural context and stories used in design? How do you research this context if you are not from that culture? And here's the kicker. Um, by the way, I am up at 4.30 AM to attend your talk, big fan. <laughs> Thank you, Shiva, for being up so, um, so early. Well, the thing about stories is they exist all over the world, like human beings everywhere make stories. Um, and, and many societies have um, traditional stories, you know, folk tales and fables, stories that are quite simple and follow a pattern. Um, and so I would encourage you to look at, you know, what are the patterns in the traditional stories around you in, in your culture. And I would love to learn more about them as well. <laughs> um, you know, I think the idea of the circle is found in, in many cultures, but the, the hero's journey is, is rather a Western idea that, that privileges this, um, you know, usually young person who then is becomes a man, you know, <laughs> through the process of entering the green world, right? The other world. Uh, so finding counter narratives for that would be really cool. Yeah, I think that the, it, it would be interesting to explore the cultural differentiations for design as storytelling, you know, cross continent uh, or multi-continent. Uh, I think that just, the way that stories are told in general in a narrative sense would change some of those things. Right. Is the number three important everywhere? Right. Maybe not, you know, it has an incredible logic to it, the yeah. sh shape of it, but <laughs> maybe seven is more important. You know? <laughs> this is a thesis presentation. Sure. Topic. You know, the four Anybody corners of the square. <laughs> Um, I've got a, a, a good question here that I'd like to also ask from Francis. Uh, do you have any tips to help pivot production-oriented designers into thinking about design more as storytelling? How to get them beyond just ticking boxes? Um, well, I, I think it really has to do with like, what what is your role in the design process? and 
if your job is to, um, you know, produce things like laying things out on a, on a grid and that's all already determined, it's hard to um, get out of that. But, it, but if your role becomes actually thinking about what users want, uh, working with users and, and including clients, right? Clients as stakeholders in the project, um, the, the whole, uh, anytime you have to explain or justify your design decisions, it gets you into storytelling, right? Into what are the emotions? What are the actions being represented? What is the desired outcome? And when we focus only on the kind of pushing things around visually, which is also great, love that stuff. <laughs> um, you know, it, it maybe doesn't have that narrative element. Mm -hmm. Often with my students, I ask, like we start very structurally, you know, with the grid and alignment. And then it's like, okay, how are you gonna add emotion to this piece? And, and that comes through like color and texture and like creating more of an atmosphere around something that might have a very, you know, perfect kind of Swiss structure to it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. I think presentation, like as a, just as a tool, helps develop those, those kind of skills out of mm -hmm. someone who might be more in a production mindset. Because mm -hmm. then you have to own it. If you're presenting it, you have to own it. 100%. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the next question uh, comes from Crystal. Um, any suggestions for folks whose design work is more hands-on and experimental, uh, or experiential, apologies, in the time of COVID? I'm a food designer and I've been feeling limited with my practice because of social distancing. Thanks for a great talk. Um, yeah, that's really tough because, you know, food is something that has to be shared and, and consumed up close. The thing is, is, is now so many people at home are cooking and, uh, and wanting to get better at cooking. So there's all these, you know, like Airbnb has this whole experience offering now. Some of you may have tried it, like you can meet the dogs of Chernobyl. <laughs> Stuff that's just like online, but um, with real people like live. And there's tons of people in the cooking space, you know, doing cooking lessons and cooking demonstrations. And it's pretty great. It's, um, it's like another way to, for someone who's in the food industry and the food design business to engage with people. I'm finding that the whole um, Zoom uh, environment, even though it's, you know, very restrictive and the interface has various problems, it has allowed um, people to just experience a lot more stuff. We were just talking before the event, like, yeah, why not go to a lecture? You don't have to park, you know? <laughs> right. You, you can be folding your laundry while you're watching the lecture and nobody knows. <laughs> I just love it. I'm seeing so many more things every week than I would if I had to physically go there. I just, I love, you know, at any time, you know, it's really fun. And there's a lot in the food space, you know, we're just talking graphic design here, but there's so much food programming that you can get involved in. All right, let me, oh, one second. I've lost my QA panel. Okay. Um, I've got one here from, I believe it is, Yadira, and I apologize if I mispronounced. Um, they asked, oh, they said, I loved your typography book. Are you writing another one? <laughs> if so, would you explore touching on variable fonts? Yes. So I am working on uh, the third edition of Thinking with Type. So the second edition was published in 2010, which is 10 years ago. It sounds like forever for you young people. <laughs> for me, it's like, what's another 10 years? <laughs> so I'm working on a third edition that's gonna be a thicker book. It's gonna be more global. Um, it, it's gonna be more digitally oriented. So some of the stuff in my type on screen book, uh, which is already out of date, will be updated for the new thinking with type. 
um, is going to have, um, yeah, stuff like variable type, which is a new new area and is, is very interesting. Yeah, so I'm excited about that. Nice. Good when I did the first thinking with type, I didn't even think like, where are the women typeface designers? Yeah. There just aren't any in that book. There's graphic designers represented, but I'm going way deeper on the next one. <laughs> I love it. Well, it's great to know. I'll definitely have to get some more bookshelf space uh, as I'm <laughs> currently running out. So <laughs> good to note. Um, the next question, um, pretty big question, I think, but uh, uh -oh. Anonymous asks, what is your simple <laughs> definition of a graphic designer? A visual janitor. I'll take Eden Lou. <laughs> <laughs> we keep it clean. <laughs> well put, well put. Um, yeah, what is a graphic designer? Um, you know, communicating with image and text, uh, often in the background, you know, often it's like the format, the frame, the delivery. It's, uh, and it's essential. Like with, if, if you run into a website that's like unstyled HTML, you know this person is crazy and is going to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like without design, people can't enter into content. It's like essential, um, and and that's what we do. Where the we shape, we create the conditions for content to make sense. That was that was great. I couldn't have strung those words together for what I for, for being a graphic designer myself. <laughs> um, this one also pretty interested in um, from an anonymous attendee. Um, they greatly appreciate your wisdom. In their learning, they've come across some designers who don't agree with this idea and they reference Sagmeister as one of them. Um, oh, yeah. what, what would you say to those people who dispute the role of narrative in design? Well, I actually, I have something about that in my book. So I went to a conference a few years ago when I was writing the book and we, I went to a dinner party and there's this young, young man across from me at dinner and he's like, um, so what are you doing? I'm like, well, storytelling. He's, oh, well, have you heard about what Sagmeister said about storytelling? I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> what? My whole project, I'm gonna have to like not do it. What did Sagmeister say? And he said, well, Sagmeister complained at an event that a guy who makes um, roller coasters, right, a roller coaster architect, described himself as a storyteller. And this totally pissed Sagmeister off because he said, you know, you're, you make roller coasters. Why isn't that enough? Why do you have to call it a story? And yet, if you think about how roller coasters are designed, they're designed with that arc. <laughs> right? Like literally. And, yeah. And they're designed to make you worried and full of suspense and concern, right? They slow you down. Sometimes they add a sound effect right up near the top, like it's creaking, like maybe the whole thing's going to fall over. And you get to the top and they like make you hesitate, right? <laughs> and then, <laughs> so like if that's not storytelling that's like visceral physical storytelling and then they make the whole thing look like it's in an old gold mine or it's like in a frozen mountain right they add the setting like scenography like in a movie <laughs> so if that's not storytelling so yes i understand that the people might disagree and um i'm cool with that i, I think <laughs> <my thinking>. different <laughs> strokes <laughs> yeah it's all to be debated I, I appreciate the question all right so agnes um submits a question that reads ux researcher here um i understand that i should aim at packaging findings as a story but sometimes there is just no story or art to it superimpose a story on the findings? Um, well, that's a very interesting question. I'd have to see what your findings are, but even um, 
even the act of distilling your findings into three main points is a kind of story. So again, if you think about beats, right? What are the, what are the main points that you want somebody to get from your findings? This is the act of editing and shaping. Otherwise it's just like a list, right? Of observations with no synthesis. Um, and so you have to do something with it. Yeah, it's almost like right. a, like story and narrative can mean two kind of different things along the same path, almost where you know you can use something like a narrative as maybe more example based, but you can you know distill your content from a findings based you know perspective into something that feels a little bit more. You know, you're you're, fo you're focusing on your research at the end of the day. Like you're not, you know, inventing some kind of fantastical narrative. Yeah, to... I mean, obviously, you want to be truthful, right, so right? Like every single person you observed had a completely random, different <laughs> <laughs> reaction. You have to say, like, shit. Like, right. no one knows what to make of your product. <laughs> yeah. Your product is the devil. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody has like a different. Yeah. I don't know. Oh, this is a good one that just came in uh, from Terry. Um, how do we make sure the experience economy moves from just experience for experience sake and more towards an engagement economy? Um, gosh, you may have to figure that out. <laughs> <laughs> That's a big one. Um, I think, you know, the experience economy is very interesting. It's an idea that was, you know, developed in the 90s right, so tw 20 years ago. Um, I think there's actually a backlash now against the experience economy. So like uh, Amazon, it's, an, it's a non-experience, right? It is not about opening a pretty package and there's like polka dot um, tissue paper in there. Uh, it's like about efficiency and logistics and reverse logistics, <laughs> right? It's a non-experience. Um, and, you know, the collapse of restaurants, right? And people just getting food delivered. Uh, that was already happening before COVID. You had these dark kitchens where there was no restaurant. It was only carry out, you know, being you know, shipped to people on uh, bicycles by messengers. So be careful what you wish for. <laughs> you know, uh, engagement, I, I, I'd love to know what, what Terry means by that. I guess that means the, um, the consumer having a more active role, right? In the 90s, when the experience economy was invented, it was very passive. It was really about um, the, the consumer uh, witnessing a kind of theater of retail, a theater of um, you know, a theme park or a themed restaurant. And of course today consumers wanna have a much more active role in like creating the brand and holding brands accountable and so forth. So more action, right? Less the, the consumer has to be part of it. The citizen, the human being, is the patient in healthcare has to be part of the action. Let's see. Oh, all right. We're back. We're good. Um, so the next question here um, is anonymous. Um, great session, Ellen. I'm wondering if you have any perspective on what the future is of graphic design as a visual narration method. Um, I think it's it's just this is where the field is headed. Mm -hmm. I think um, you know that graphic design is often called upon to describe processes, how to do something. Uh, um, things that take place over time. Um, and, and even when we're doing really two-dimensional work, we we're explaining ideas that people have to uh, uncover over time. Any, anytime there's humor in your work, that's temporal, 
that's like a, I see it once and then I see it a different way and that's what makes it funny and that, so there's this this time shift uh, and I, so I think embracing that element of time whether you're in a narrative digital narrative class like what what was mentioned earlier or in a 2d design situation it's Finding time is really exciting. Yeah, definitely. We have time for a couple more, I think, at least a few. Um, oh, here's a good one. Uh, can you tell us something, anything, about your life as a female designer, writer, and or storyteller? So pretty broad question. Um. Well, you know, I live a life of great privilege, you know, uh, you know, as a, a white woman, um, I have a lot of privilege in this society and I am really uh, aware of that and uh, grateful for that and concerned what that privilege means in relation to people who don't have it. Um, and so I, I started writing a book two years ago about feminism and graphic design. Uh, and I was working on it with my best friend, which was really fun. And, and as we were reading about feminism, we're like, oh my God, <laughs> like feminism has this history of, of being a kind of white discourse that has excluded women of color. Um, and as we worked on this book, we realized that it couldn't just be about feminism. It, it had to be about anti-racism. It had to be about um, disability and inclusion. Um, and the book became much more complex and we added six more authors. <laughs> we realized that to do this book, uh, it had to be much broader than just about you know women. It had to be about uh, more more inclusive issues and and who who's in design, who we design for, who gets a voice. Um, so that's my next book. It's called Extra Bold: A uh, Feminist, uh, Anti-Racist, Inclusive Non-Binary Field Guide for Graphic Designers, and it's coming out in May. 2021 and it's co-authored with Jennifer Tobias and Kalina Sales and Josh Halstead and Farah Cafe and Valentina Vergara and Leslie Ja. Fantastic. <laughs> I'm first in line. Of so that's my answer. <laughs> it's like way bigger than being a woman. It's like yeah complicated situation. Well, and I think in a, certainly in this day and age, <laughs> presently, uh, being fully aware of like the need to have more voices to speak to these issues in design, but also at large, <laughs> is incredibly important, to say the least. It's a big learning process. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I'm going to wrap us up. We have one final question. Um, I think this one actually overlaps quite a bit with uh, some of the other questions we have. Um, but I'll read it out. Uh, Joy says, thanks so much, Ellen. Um, a common here. <laughs> Love your talk and books. What would you suggest for junior designers who want to level up their storytelling skill? You mean uh, what to read or what to do? Um, Good question. Uh, doing, I would say design more GIFs. <laughs> <laughs> I was looking at GIFs today because I was like, oh, there's a loop, you know, circles and design. That is so fun. And I think GIFs have become like the essential storytelling medium of our time, including, you know, horrific images of police brutality that cycle over and over again and become a new kind of cultural memory, right? They're just terrible. Um, and then the, the, the humor, the, the GIF as a new kind of way to like sign off on an email. <laughs> and often we just like grab these things from websites, but they're actually really fun to make. And it's like a little like two second narrative with, a, you know, some of them perfectly cycle from beginning to end. So make more GIFs. You, you heard it here. <laughs> <laughs> 
I think that's a wonderful sign off. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Yeah, of course. It was really thank fun to be here. Of course. We were so happy to host you. It was a wonderful presentation. For everybody that's still here, thanks for tuning in. Uh, totally appreciate the questions. I'm sorry that we couldn't get to all of them. They flooded in, uh, but we, we did <laughs> as we could. Um, I'm trying to think if I have anything else to mention. Uh, definitely follow uh, AIGA Toledo for our upcoming, you know, current uh, events schedule and anything else fun that we're doing. Make sure you follow Ellen on social media um, to make sure that you're keeping up on what she's doing and all of the wonderful publications and books that I'm sure will be coming out very soon and the one in May I will be ordering <laughs> ASAP. Um, and I think with that we can we can head out. So everybody have a great night and thanks again Ellen. Really appreciate it. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Ohio. All right. <laughs> Bye, Bye, I love you. Goodbye.